It's the Renaissance Festival Podcast. A dirty bum approached a man and stopped him on the street. He begged the man for money to get a bite to eat. The man asked, "We are just buy beer." Or gamble it away The bum said, no my lord I'd never treat your gift this way The man said, then come home with me To lay your robe and rambling Then my wife can see What would happen to me If I gave up drinking and gambling Tis later than you think Our lives are just a blink We've stories to tell So live them well And give me one more drink a young man walking down the street He'd had a pint or three Had one foot on the sidewalk The other on the street He walked like that an hour A stagger to his gait Seems his uneven path Was more than he could take The sheriff did come up to him And asked him was he drunk The man replied Thank God and cried I thought my leg had shrunk is later than you think Our lives are just a blink We've stories to tell So live them well And give me one more drink Now these two old men were drinking As they'd had for many years They laughed at all the times They'd had too many beers And as they sat partaking One gets a misty eye and ask the favor of his friend Should he be first to die Will you pour a beer upon my grave In case I get a thirst His friend agreed to do the deed But it go through his bladder first Tis later than you think Our lives are just a blink We've stories to tell So live them well And give me one more drink Then his song's been rather silly and now it's almost through I'd like to thank you kindly For letting me sing for you And let me say just one more thing Before we all must part For now the jokes are over And I mean this from my heart To sing for you's my honor I tell you this in song I hate goodbyes, no tears, no sighs so I'll just say so long. Hello and welcome once again to the Renaissance Festival Music Podcast. This is Season 15, Episode 23, Tell Me a Story. Yes, we're going to look at some of the storytellers on the Renaissance Festival circuit, as well as giving you a little bit of new music during the show. That was Drinking Stories, performed by Brett Blackshear, from the album Fingers, Frets, and Fire. You can find out more about him at facebook.com slash blackshearsmusic. That's B-L-A-C-K-S-H-E-A-R-S music. I'm your host, Chuck Burke. As I say, we're going to be looking at some storytellers this time around. We want to thank our sponsors, the Louisiana Renaissance Festival, which is in progress now, Renaissance Magazine, the Ren Cruise, the patrons of the podcast, as well as the team of podcast minions that put the show together. We want to offer special thanks to all the performers who submit music for the show. We currently have 642 albums from 285 performers in our podcast library. We'd like to add more. As I say, we're going to have some new music in this show, but we're getting a little low on the new music, so if you're part of an act, or if you know anybody who's one of the performers, has a new CD coming out, let us know. Go to our website, renaissancefestivalmusic.com, and look for the link to submit music, and send it to us so that we can put it on the air. Coming up next is Pirate LeChuck. A little bit of a story skit piece from Boca Musica from their album Live Free or Die. Boca Musica is a group we've heard on here fairly frequently. They've been around for over 22 years. They're based out of the Detroit area. They describe themselves as a drinking group with a singing problem. Find out more about them at www.bocamusica.com. 
<laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> All right, now, before I let you do any more songs, let me tell you a little about myself. Pirate Lachat. <laughs> I have been having lots of bands come to try out for this gig. Um, I, um... <laughs> I had a band come in here. They called themselves OCDC. Instead of playing music, they just adjusted their equipment for an hour. I think I know them. We had a band. We had a band come in. They uh, only played Goo Goo Dolls and Lady Gaga. They called themselves Goo Goo Gaga. <laughs> Of course, being French-Canadian, Brian Adams wanted to audition, but everything he did just didn't do it for me. <laughs> All right, let's see what else you've got. Yeah. That took a second. <laughs> I saw Brian Adams open for Journey in 1981. Just saying. Name open for people. who? Journey! <laughs> I got friends in old places. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> You're as old as I am. Uh, I'm minding my own business, right? <laughs> Hi, this is Vince Conaway, hammered dulcimer player, telling you that the Louisiana Renaissance Festival is a highlight of talent from the festival circuit. Come see Paulo Garbanzo, Christoph the Insulter, Jacques the Whipper, Shakespeare Approves, Chased Treasure, and so much more. Plus, you know, me. Situated around a beautiful lake, the village is full of incredible vendors and has some of the best food on circuit, which is to be expected in southern Louisiana. I look forward to seeing you there in the fall. In 2005, Nigel Bunshaft, a violin maker and handyman, bought a tiny cottage in the small English seaside town of Stoke-on-Trent by Darcy-upon-Avon by the sea. The Tudor dwelling had been built sometime in the late 16th century, but had fallen into severe disrepair. Indeed, it appeared little more than a dilapidated shack when Nigel acquired it. But Nigel saw great possibilities for its restoration and began working on it immediately. It wasn't until nearly two years later in 2007 that Nigel made a fascinating discovery. One day, while polishing the stone floor in the room that served as his kitchen, one of the slabs of rock moved slightly. Nigel found that the stone lifted up, revealing a small compartment. In the compartment lay a tiny wooden box. He opened it to find a locket, a woman's hand mirror, and a small snuff box. And one other thing. A packet of parchment papers, bound with string. Atop the packet was a single, yellowed piece of paper with a short verse written in faint but legible script. It read, Shall I marry, or shall I drink? Fill thou my cup, man, while I think. True love's a comfort in foul weather, but a good brown ale doth down me better. Signed, A. G. H. Fifteen eighty five. Thus begins the story of perhaps the greatest of the little known sixteenth century poets who labored beneath the shadow of William Shakespeare. This is the story of Arthur Greenleaf Holmes. Nationalized Public Radio and the University of Our Lady of Notre Dame presents The Life and Rhymes of Poet Arthur Greenleaf Holmes Made possible by a generous donation from the law firm of Streamly Wall Endowed and the listeners to this nationalized public radio station. You just heard The Discovery from the album The Life and Rhymes of Arthur Greenleaf Holmes. This is the album telling the story of the poet Arthur Greenleaf Holmes. 
a performer that we find in the festivals now, but perhaps he really was around back in the 1500s. You can find out more about him at www.arthurgreenleafholmes.com. If you take a look over at the Renaissance Festival Music Podcast Facebook page, you can see what we have coming up here. We are, of course, getting towards the end of the year and the end of the Renaissance Festival season, but we still have a few festivals that are running. The Louisiana Renaissance Festival is running until December 8th. Among the acts you can catch there are Chase Treasure, the Whiskey Bay Rovers, and the Jack Dolls. You can also catch Three Pints Gone at the Camelot Days in Hollywood, Florida, coming up November 16th and 17th. Also November 16th is Bladesgiving 2019, featuring the musical Blades and Pictus. That's taking place at the Voodoo Lounge in Kansas City, Missouri. On November 23rd, the Misbehaving Maidens are performing at the Limerick Pub in Wheaton, Maryland. On November 30th, Bardlocked is performing at the Shenanigans in Dahlonega, Georgia. Again, that is on November 30th. Coming up on December 6th, you can catch the Bilge Pumps at Dickens on the Strand in Galveston, Texas. And on December 7th, you can catch Bounding Maine's Maritime Holiday Show at the Beulah Brinton House in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. As always... You can check our Facebook page for an updated list of events that are happening, including performances from your favorite acts. Be sure to check us out there. Up next is the final track from The Life and Rhymes of Arthur Greenleaf Holmes, The Poet Disappears, where we get our last glimpse at the mysterious life of this poet. With the story of Arthur Greenleaf Holmes a novel, one might arrive at the end and suspect that several pages had been torn out. Were it a song, you'd think the singer had forgotten a few verses. With the story of Arthur Greenleaf Holmes a meal, you refused to pay the server until he brought out the dessert and coffee. And if it were the physical act of lovemaking, you'd turn to your partner and say, Why, yes, dear, that was all I dreamed of and more. We humans, as a rule, are not given to abrupt endings. We prefer tidiness, nice packaging, and plausible resolutions. We expect closure, as we call it, and when it is not afforded us, we act as if some supreme injustice had been doled out by an uncaring deity who doesn't seem to understand that we know some very powerful attorneys. But fate, as usual, has other ideas. The simple fact of the matter is Arthur Greenleaf Holmes never published another poem again, at least as far as we know. There are no further letters, no more journal entries, no more verses. This poet, who had so suddenly captured the fancy of much of England, just as suddenly disappeared. Some believe he was forced to flee England by the Anglican Church. Others believe he may have been murdered by henchmen or secretly imprisoned. Perhaps he decided to retire to a life of anonymity. But that seems unlikely, since not a single journal entry expresses any desire to do so. Professor M. H. Langdon. Well, it was such an abrupt departure from the public eye, and it, it created pandemonium in England. Uh, the riots broke out in London. In, in the town of Chester, one man who claimed to have received the latest poem from Arthur was placed in the stocks for a month when it was discovered that he'd been lying. And the poem was entitled Me Have Earwig, and it was written in sheep dung. <laughs> Whatever the truth, the world knows that Arthur Greenleaf Holmes left us with far too little. One is reminded of other great artists who left the world at an early age. John Keats, who died at the age of 25, or Mozart, who lived only until 35. Such genius, when it departs this world prematurely, leaves us with the tormented question, what might have been? What might they have achieved had the grave not called them away? So it is with Arthur Greenleaf Holmes but with one further twist of the knife. We do not know if he in fact died young or if he chose not to write again. Or, and herein lies one faint, tantalizing ray of hope, are there more of his writings, lying in some dank cellar or locked wooden chest, waiting to thrill us anew? As of now, we do not know. But hope, as they say, springs eternal.
are ye a fan of medieval and renaissance history? Then join our crew of Discovery. Renaissance Magazine covers history, fairs, and reenactments. Six issues a year allows you to explore nearly 1,400 years of wars, art and science, and daily life. Find a treasure trove of images and behind-the-scenes stories of Renaissance fairs across the country. Subscribe at renaissancemagazine.com. Thanks, mateys. Lilac was a small purple dragon who spent all his time in the wilderness with his fairy friends. His special talent, as all dragons have special talents, was smelling flowers. Now, again, this sounds like a rather unuseful talent, but indeed he found many reasons to use it. For example, he could step into the forest, take a deep breath and... Oh no, the wisteria's gotten ill! Or... Huzzah! The ivy remains healthy this year! Now, the earth fairies who tended the flowers most certainly appreciated his gift, but the other dragons sought to tease him for it. You're not a real dragon, some would say. You spend your days playing with flowers, others would tease. It never made Lilac feel very useful, nor very happy. So, one day, when he had quite enough of being bullied, he decided to take action. He decided to have a contest. Now, if you're the one arranging the contest, it makes sense to hold one which allows you to do something you're good at. For example, if I were to hold a contest, it would be storytelling as that's what I pride myself on. Lilac decided that his contest would be a flower-smelling competition. Naturally, he asked the fairies to help. He had them go out to the forest and select a special flower in secret to be kept under a blackened glass bell jar until the time would come for each competitor to try and guess what the flower was. He invited all of the dragons in the nearby lands, especially those who had picked on him. And the day finally came. All of the dragons lined up and Lilac took the last position since he was the host. First up was Dendron, a great green forest dragon. He was probably Lilac's greatest competition as he spent his time in the same forests. Dendron stepped up, took a deep breath and pondered for a minute. He could tell it was a springtime flower, but he wasn't sure quite which one, and thus took a guess. It might be... Oh, tis a bunch of clover, he tried. The fairies smiled and, and shook their heads. <laughs> Not quite. And so he went to the back of the line in case he got to try again. Next up was Sulfur, a quite long yellow dragon who lived in the swamps. He took his sniff and thought about what he could smell. Unfortunately for him, his nose was filled with the smell of his name. Sulfur. Smells like rotten eggs. So he could only come up with one answer. Tis a rotten flower, he tried. The fairies giggled in a way which I can't quite replicate and said, Sorry, but no. And, and Sulfur followed Dendron to the back of the line. Following Sulfur was Bubble, a massive blue water dragon. She lived in the nearby lake and rarely came out from her home. As such, when she smelled the flowers under the bell jar, all she could smell was fish. She knew there was no such a thing as fish flowers, and she assumed since the flowers had come from the forest, I would now be kelp or lily, and so she thought long and hard. She knew that fish were a kind of meat, and so she thought about the plants that were carnivorous, which means they eat meat. So finally, she came up with a Venus flytrap, the most famous of the carnivorous plants. The fairies smiled and shook their heads. Not even close, they sang, taunting a little bit and bubble followed sulfur and dendron. Finally, before Lilac would compete, came the most massive of all the dragons. He was the largest in both wingspan and in height. Ash, the giant red dragon. 
Uh, he was a fire dragon and poor Lilac's biggest bully. But since he spent his days breathing fire, when he took a deep breath, all he could smell was the remnants of fire. Clearly, he bellowed without even taking a moment to think. Tis a burnt flower. The fairies started to giggle before Ash gave them a mean look and they were cut short. No, a snail burnt flower, they taunted, barely able to hold back their laughter. <laughs> and so Ash lumbered off to the end of the line. At last, it was Lilac's turn. And the fairies had barely lifted the bell jar when he blushed from his horns down to the tip of his tail. Well, you didn't have to go and do that, he exclaimed, and the fairies started tittering, knowing he had caught on to their little joke. Ah, tis lilacs, he cried happily, and was proven correct as if he lifted the jar all the way and allowed him the sight of the pretty purple flowers. The fairies had actually fashioned the flowers into a crown and placed it upon lilac's head to show that he had won. And from that way, day onward, none of the rest of the dragons teased him for his special talents. After all, it is boring if everyone has the same ones. That was Lilac the Dragon, performed by Bonnie Moffat, from her album First Fabuli. I introduced you to Ms. Moffat on an earlier show, a couple shows back. She describes herself as something of an accidental performer. She was working at a vendor at a fair several years back, but discovered that she had a knack for storytelling. She's growing her act, hopes to be expanding her footprint over the next year or so. You can find out more about her at facebook.com slash blacklipsbonniemoffat. Coming up next from her, we have The Fox and the Crow, also from First Fabuli. Tales tell of a handsome crow, known for his intelligence, and a beautiful and wily Todd, what the English hunt and call a fox. They lived near to one another in the forest. Now the Todd, being his own trickster self, often would find ways to create shenanigans and find himself the better for his task. As such, the crow had always been wary of the Todd and avoided him as much as possible. However, one day, the crow found himself in the possession of a delightful scrap of cheese. Naturally, with his especially strong nose, the Todd came sniffing about to inquire about the crow's bounty. The crow, not trusting the Todd, flew up to the top of the tree he had been sitting under, and now looked down upon the Todd haughtily. Oh, crow, the Todd crooned. May I share your cheese with your dear neighbour? He tried, smiling, his best toothy grin. The crow squawked down at him and rustled his feathers in reply. How rude of you, the Todd called up. But perhaps I have been bested by the smartest, for indeed they call you the most intelligent of the forest. And quite pleased with this turn, the crow opened his beak to retort and to thank the Todd, only for the piece of cheese to tumble from it down to the forest floor below. Within an instant, the Todd snatched up the piece of cheese, cackling as he delighted in his new treat. Serves you right, he threw an insult. And just shared with me, I wouldn't have taken it all. But as you think yourself better than others, I had to prove you otherwise. And so the crow lost his treat, and remembered that intelligence must also be paired with kindness, lest one fall into the traps of those who surpass you in another skill. If the weather's feeling icky and you want to get away And you wonder how the water's feeling up and down the bay If you need a good vacation, well you know you just can't lose When you make your reservations for the Renaissance Cruise Great entertainment, fabulous food It's guaranteed to improve your mood If you need a good vacation and you know you just can't lose When you make your reservations for the Renaissance Cruise bump it come play! Visit www.therencruise.com for full details and to reserve. My father gave to me A saddle of tooled leather A restless horse, a well-honed blade 
passed down from his father. He asked me if I knew the way. I told him I will find mine. Just come back was all he'd say. So long ago, so far away. My mother gave to me her kiss, a silent blessing. I searched her face to know her thoughts, but I was left to guessing. She held out the cloak of wool that I had seen her weaving. I smiled. I took the gift, but I could feel her grieving. I rode my steed up from the plan to the ridge above Loch Carn, where my love waited. Open arms for the parting we had planned on. The flower that she gave to me had soft, deep crimson petals. I climbed back on my mountain leaf, so tall there in the saddle. told you we'd be hearing some new music on the show. That was The Gifts, performed by Misfits of Avalon, from their album, Avalon Moon. Misfits of Avalon have been entertaining lovers of Celtic music all over New England for the last ten years. They've currently got three CDs available. This is a new one that's just become available to us on the podcast. We have another track from that, Josephine's Waltz, again from the album Avalon Moon.
Fugley here, and I'm at the Hot Springs Renaissance Festival with Travis, who's going to tell us an amusing story of running the fair. It's a great way to actually learn uh, how Black Friday probably was supposed to actually be. The, and I've worked Black Friday before, but literally for our first year, the first four hours of the day of opening up, there was nonstop. There were there were customers one after one after one after one, and literally it almost blew up my phone uh, as I was taking uh, Square stuff. So it was all my credit cards, and it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. But it was like looking at the uh, proverbial Black Friday at Walmart all over again. And this is good news to all of you out there. There is hope for your fare as well. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. The Great Russian Ratpok Incident. Fair warning. This is the most dangerous tale I tell. I was in the village of Hartsville for their festival. And I had been telling stories most of the day. And I come down the lane, and I round the corner, and I notice a group of people standing around a tree. And then I realized it was a group of puckers. Now let me explain what a pucker is. These are a group of people that play a game called a rat puck. Now mind you, it's very, very similar to the game of golf, which you see, they use the whole rat, not just the balls. Now, this group had been playing through the lanes, and, well, the grand tournament was going on. And as I round the corner... I noticed there's a gypsy boy, and he's got a bow and an arrow, and pointing up in the tree and going, Now, what is that lad doing? And about this time, I hear someone cry, Arrow! Now, I happen to know someone by the name of Arrow. She's a fairy. So I look around to see, and, oh, no, she's not there. And that's about the time I see the arrow come tumbling back out of the tree, and the villagers scatter. Now, as a traveling bard, I've seen quite a few things in my lifetime. And one thing I can tell you, is if you're in an area with nobles and royalty, and what are your common folk? Don't gather around. Don't make a crowd. For all that does is attract royalty. And if you don't want to attract them, you don't want to do that. Well, after that, I noticed the queen had taken a look up from what she was doing. I'm going, oh boy, this might get entertaining. So I stood around just to see what was going to happen. Well, what the gypsy boy was firing at was one of the rat pucks. Oh, that's actually one of the rats was stuck up way up high in a tree. And well, since the bow and arrow didn't work, he decided he was going to scamper up the tree. Well, he looked around and tried to reach a low branch and he couldn't quite do it. So he looked and asked for help. And well, who was there but to help him? But one of the queen's fools, Mr. Tom Foolery himself. And well, he gave the gypsy boy a boost up in the tree. And mom, that little boy that could climb, he climbed just like a squirrel right on up into the tree. And it was about that time they'd gotten the queen's attention. And she come down with her guard. And as she comes down, the gypsy lad has gotten on up into the tree, right about where the rat's at. And she looks at her her fool and Tom Foolery, she calls. What is going on here? And Tom looks and goes, well, there's a rat in the tree. We're trying to get it. And she looks up and she sees the gypsy boy. And she looks up at the boy, then down at Tom and says, How did the boy get up in the tree? And Tom looks, he goes, Well, well, it wasn't my fault. And Tom points at the Russian ambassador. He goes, He was the one that got the rat stuck in the tree. Now the Russian ambassador comes up. And mind you, I did not know an ambassador could grovel. He grovels rather well. Just about as well as Tom Foolery, for about that time the queen glared at Tom Foolery. And that fool hit the ground just like a gypsy. It's absolutely amazing to watch. Now, as she was scolding the ambassador and Tom Foolery, the gypsy boy was up in the tree and he decided to start bouncing on the branch to knock the rat loose. And oh, it come loose all right, come right out of the tree and right at the queen's feet about then I decided I think I need to back away. As I took two steps away the queen looks down at Tom Foolery, looks at the rat, then over at the Russian ambassador. When she's done looking at those she looks up in the tree and at the gypsy boy and she goes lad come down come down now. The lad starts to scamper down the tree and then she looks at Tom Foolery, and the ambassador says, You two! 
I will speak with you later. And she tells them to stand aside. Now as they stand aside, the little gypsy boy drops out of the tree. And she commands him. She goes, boy, come hither. Now, and I thought Tom Foolery could go grovel. And I thought the Russian ambassador could grovel. Hoy, both of them were absolute amateurs. That boy not only hit the ground, but I think he dug himself in about two inches. When she was, he was done groveling, the queen goes, No, 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 lad, I didn't want you to grovel. Take a knee. He looks a bit puzzled. And as he's taking a knee, she reaches behind her and grabs her guard's sword right out of the scabbard. Now I'm thinking, oh my, this is going to get ugly. This is going to be, oh, there goes a gypsy. Now she did something absolutely amazing. She knights the gypsy. Calls him a hero, calls him a knight. And gives the gypsy boy a title. When she's done with that, she looks at her fool and the ambassador and sends them both over to the jail and tells them both that they have to sing I'm a pretty, pretty princess in Russian. Now the two of them went over there and in both in good spirits and good sports, linked arms, kicking back and forth in cadence, and said, I'm a pretty, pretty princess, in Russian, over and over and over again. And that, folks, is the great Russian rat puck incident. That was the tale of the great Russian rat punch incident, performed by Alexander Silver from the album The Gate Home and Other Tales. Alexander describes himself simply as a Celtic storyteller, telling some original stories and some traditional ones. Up next from him, we have The Want of a Nail, which is a traditional tale. That is also from The Gate Home and Other Tales. You can find out more about him at www.alexthebard1.wixsite.com slash traveling hyphen bard. Now this be a traditional tale. It is Want for a Nail, and it is a very traditional tale with, well, my own personal twist on it. I was taking a stroll out, out in an old, old set of woods, come across this clearing, and sitting on the keystone of a once grand building was an old man, and was, was sitting there fiddling something between his fingers and saying over and over and over again, it's all me fault, it's all me fault. Well now, the little voice in the back of me head, and we all have one, mine happens to be an Irish lass, well, she goes, Alec, Alec, you want to talk to him. You really want to talk to him, Alec. And, well, I've learned from experience, you do not ignore that voice. So I went up to the man and said, well, good sir, what be all your fault? And, well, he looks me up and down and sees both wineskins I'm carrying. I happen to be carrying two. And, well, this is my good summer mead. And he looks, he goes, oi, give me a pull off that skin and I'll tell you. So I hand him me skin, and, well, he doesn't take one pull, nay. He doesn't take two, no, 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 no. He takes three long pulls off my good skin. So about half me skin. I'm thinking, well, this better be good. That was expensive. And he smiles, he goes, oh, that was good mead. Come sit, and he pats the stone next to him. And I sit down, he goes, lad, at one point, this was the seat of a grand old kingdom. And in this kingdom, the people were treated fairly. The animals were well fed. The crops were aplenty and, well, taxes were even low. I go, aye, I think I remember tales of this. He goes, aye. Well, he goes, and with any good thing, we had jealousy and we had a neighbor that wanted what we had and he couldn't get it himself. So he decided to declare war. And the war was long and hard fought. And on the eve of the final battle, a knight come into a blacksmith shop to get his horse shoed. And while well, the apprentice there was all but out of nails, and he didn't want to make any more. So he told the knight, nay, he could not shoe the horse. It was too late for the knight to go to anywhere else. So, for the want of a nail, the horse was not shod. For the want of a horse, the knight did not ride into battle. For the want of the knight, the unit did not ride. For the want of the unit, the battle was lost. For the loss of the battle, the war was lost, and, well, alas... For the loss of the war, the kingdom fell. And I looked at the man, I go, Oi, I remember this one. This is a teaching song, I remember this. He goes, Oi. I go, but good sir, what does that have to do with you? 
It was about that time he stopped twirling what he had between his fingers. It was a nail. And he says, Lad, I was the boy that did not want to go make any more nails. Lad, you see, sometimes even the smallest things have the grandest repercussions. I looked at the man and thought for a minute, then smiled. He goes, and I told him, Good sir, are the people from that kingdom still here? He goes, I. Are they still good people? He goes, I. Well then, sir, you lost nothing. You just lost an old building. Now tell me more about this kingdom. And well, he did. We shared both skins of wine that night. We talked long into the wee hours of the morning. But alas, those are tales from another time. Thanks so much for listening to the show. A special thanks to all of you out there who are helping us. We have over 25 people supporting us at the moment, and we can use all the help we can get. This show is definitely an act of love, as all of us are volunteers who work for the podcast, and all of your support goes right back into helping make the show possible. We at the podcast would like to extend a special thanks to our friends of the podcast, Elizabeth Burkholder, Mari Vopio, and Stephen Conroy, and also we'd really like to thank our honorary minions, Jesse Linder, who's on Facebook, at jessielinder.bard, Am I Misguided? And Randall Kimbrough. Thank you so much for all you do to help us make this show possible. track was The Midsummer's Meeting by Far From Home from their album, Of Course. This is Greg from The Ren List, the easiest way to find Renaissance fairs near you. It's November now, which means most fairs are going into hibernation until next year. The Sarasota Medieval Fair in Florida opens on November 9th and continues through December 1st. The Louisiana Renaissance Festival in Hammond is open through December 8th. The Carolina Renaissance Festival and Texas Renaissance Festival are also open through the beginning of December. There are a handful of other smaller fairs happening in the next few weeks, largely in the southern half of the United States. Now is also a great time to start thinking about your fair circuit for next year, and The Renlist makes it super easy to put your itinerary together. Go to therenlist.com to get started now. Next up is a track by Tom Lorre. From his album Dancing in the Streets, this is more intense. <laughs>
So your favorite Ren Fair's come and gone. No time to feel blue until it comes around again. This is what you do. Go ride your mouse-drawn chariot to find your favorite songs played by the Minion Leprechauns at Renaissance Festival Music dot com. I'm a traveling man that's for certain. Some folk think the drinking's me job. But I need a small ale just to tell a tall tale For which people will pay a few bucks I've traveled all over this country I've drunk in the east and the west But from Lansing to Wick I can march double quick For the pubs up in Yorkshire are best So here's to the grand pubs of Yorkshire the white mare, the star, and the plow, the admiral bed, and the parson's revenge. How I wish I was drinking there now. Of London, I've not much to tell. And Devon's got cream cheese and tea. And Kent's got its needs, but it's better in Leeds, where John Tedley's a brewer for me. In Birmingham town, I got stranded. It's down in the Midlands, you know Where the beer is all flat I could never drink that And the bar keeps her all bloody slow So here's to the grand pubs of Yorkshire The white mare, the star, and the plow The admiral man and the parson revenge How I wish I was drinking there now There's a chap called McEwen in Scotland and the beer that he brews isn't bad But the secrets he knew for the beer that he brews He stole from an old Yorkshire man I once knew a chap went to Ireland Where the beer is so dark that it's black But the whiskey is fine and the girls they're divine So I don't know if he's coming back to drink in the grand pubs of Yorkshire The white mare, the star, and the plow The admiral Ben and the parson's revenge How I wish I was drinking there now I know what some people are thinking That to leave such a heaven I'm mad But when I left my home and decided to roam I didn't know that fear could be bad Traveled all over this country I've drunk in the east and the west But from Lansing to Wick I can march double quick For the pubs up in Yorkshire are best So here's to the grand pubs of Yorkshire The white man, the star, and the plow The Admiral Ben and the Parsons' Revenge How I wish I was drinking there now so let's drink to the grand pubs of Yorkshire The white man, the star, and the plow The admiral man and the parson's revenge How I wish I was drinking, how I wish I was drinking I wish I was drinking there now A little bit more new music for the show here that was the Grand Pubs of Yorkshire, performed by Landlocked from their album, The Devil's Own Invention. You can find out more about this duo at www.landlocked.com. That's L-A-N-D-L-O-C-H-D dot com. They claim they're two men who met upon the high seas, decided to share love of Celtic and pirate music with the masses. They're certainly doing that here. Our second song from them is Courtin' in the Kitchen, which is the song that gives us the title of their album, Devil's Own Invention. You'll hear that as part of the lyrics. Again, that is by Landlocked. Mm-hmm. 
Come single, bell and bow, unto me pay attention. Don't ever fall in love, it's the devil's own invention. Once I fell in love with a lady so bewitching, Miss Henrietta Bell down in Captain Kelly's kitchen with a toorlooralla, 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 with a toorlooralla, toorlooralla, toorlooralla. At the age of 17, I was apprenticed to a grocer Not far from Stevens Green, where Miss Henry used to go, sir Her manners were so fine, she set my heart a-twitching She invited me to a courtin' in the kitchen With a toorlooralla, toorlooralla, toorlooralla Toorlooralla, with a toorlooralla Toorlooralla, toorlooralla Next Sunday be the day that we were to have our flare up. I dressed myself quite gay in a frizz and oiled my hair up. The captain had no wife, he had gone a fishing, so we kicked off our life to a hoolie in the kitchen with the toorlooralla. Toorlooralla, 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 with the toorlooralla. Toorlooralla, toorlooralla, toorlooralla. Slipped up to her room, I said, good Lord Almighty. She came back down the stairs, wearing nothing but her nighty. With her arms around me waist, she slyly hinted marriage. When to the door in haste came Captain Kelly's carriage with the toorlooralla. Toorlooralla, 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 with the toorlooralla. Toorlooralla, toorlooralla. When the captain came downstairs and saw my situation In spite of all my prayers, I was marched up to the station For me they said no bail, though to get home I was itching And I had to tell the tale of how I came into the kitchen I swore she didn't invite me, though she gave a firm denial For assault they didn't indict me, and I was sent to trial She swore I robbed the house, in spite of all me screeching And I got six months hard for me courting in the kitchen With a toorlooralla, toorlooralla, toorlooralla Toorlooralla, with a toorlooralla, 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 with a toorlooralla, 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 with a toorlooralla, 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 toorlooralla. John, I've got a bone to pick with you. Is it a turkey leg? The Renaissance Festival podcast at renaissancefestivalmusic.com. With muted thumps, the apples fall. With careful aim from atop our ladders. Into the outstretched blankets held with four corners of family. Gathering corners like a dance, we shuffle to the wagon baskets. Toddlers cradle windfall treats. Shiny globes of autumn color. Cool and crisp the morning air, sweet and earthy melds in fragrance. Sunshine scatters the morning mist to heighten the contrast of lengthening shadows. <laughs> Chestnut shire hitched to the wagon, nigh sixteen hands of gentle strength. Through the years our close companion eats apples proffered by our young. Now children nestled amongst the baskets and leather reins and practiced hands. We trundle off with the weight of harvest. We walk together through this land. Old worn boots scuff through the weeds that loose the seeds to loamy earth. My eyes turn up to rusty leaves and deep sapphire sky beyond. Green and red and golden hued, these fruits drank sun and summer rain to distill the scent of autumn sweet that fills our heads with music. Drink in fall, listen closely. Family laughing with delight, dusty stamps of horseshoed footfalls, sheep and crows and creaky wheels. Through the gate and across the bridge that spans the sparkling valley stream, past the pen of Gloucester old spots, soon to the orchards loosed to gleam. While up the road, amongst the hedgerows, Ripe with berries and flush with birds. Squirrels and hedgehogs grow fat for the winter, feasting on the harvest spread. So now the yield of time and spirit, blessings to our kitchens come. Our hands can cradle such perfection held in nature's simple form. Slices, chutneys, sauces, and syrups, we fill our larder for the winter, baskets full of fragrant orbs. 
and the hint of future pies to come. While in the old stone millhouse this abundance from the earth has come, I taste the cider on my lips with sweet anticipation. Round the Suffolk sorrel he turns, our nostrils steam in morning cold. The wheel it turns, and so the years, connecting generations. Now cellars stocked and cider cast. The creaking wooden press is clean until the next year's harvest comes from our gracious apple trees. So when the winter blows through the branches bare and pigs have gleaned the orchards clean, we'll wassail the trees and give our thanks for the blessings of the seasons. That was An Ode to Apples, performed by With Stone, from the album Holiday Traditions. This is a group that's new to us. We have gotten multiple new CDs from them recently. I'll be featuring more of their music in our upcoming holiday special, which is coming up not in the next show, but the show after that, just in time for Yule, Christmas, Hanukkah, and all the other traditional winter holidays. We're always looking for feedback on the podcast here. Let us know what you like, what you don't like what you'd like to hear more of. You can contact us through our Facebook page, through our website, www.renaissancefestivalmusic.com, or at renfestpodcast at gmail.com for email. Please let us know what you're thinking about the show. We always look forward to hearing from you. I'm going to close out with a song that tells a story, a rather prolonged story, about an Irish immigrant. This is Kilkenny, Ireland, performed by Mary Mischief from their album Just Love Songs. You can find out more about them at www.marymischief.net. So until next time, take care, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> Ireland, 18 and 60, my dear, and loving son John. Your good friend, the schoolmaster, Pat McNamara, so good to write these words down. Your brothers have all gone to find work in England, the house so empty and sad. The crop of potatoes is sorely infected with a third to a half of them bad And your sister Bridget and Patrick O'Donnell are going to get married in June Your mother says not to work on the railroad and be sure to come on home soon Kill Kelly Ireland 18 and 70 dear and loving son John Hello to your missus and to your four children May they grow healthy and strong Well Michael has got in a wee bit of trouble I guess that he never will learn Because of the dampness there's no turf to speak of And now we have nothing to burn and Bridget is happy and named a child for her And now she's got six of her own You say you found work but you don't say what kind Or when you will be coming home Kilkelly, Ireland, 18 and 80 Dear Michael and John, my son I'm sorry to give you the very sad news But your dear own mother passed on We buried her down at the church in Kilkelly Your brothers and Bridget were there You don't have to worry, she died very quickly Remember her in your prayers And it's so good to hear that Michael's returning with money He's sure to buy land For the crop has been poor And the people are selling At any price that they can
some John I guess that I must be now close on 80 It's 30 years since you've gone And because of all of the money you sent me I'm still living out on my own Michael has built himself a fine house And Bridget's daughters have grown and thank you for sending your family picture They're lovely young women and men You see that you might even come for a visit What joy to see you again Kill Kelly, Ireland, 1892 My dear brother John I'm sorry that I didn't write sooner to tell you that father passed on. He was living with Bridget, she says he was cheerful and healthy right down to the end. Ah, you should have seen him play with the grandchildren of Pat McNamara, your friend. We buried him down alongside a mother down at Churchyard. He was a strong and a feisty old man, considering his life was so hard. And it's funny the way that he kept talking about you. He asked for you at the end. Oh, why don't you think about coming to visit? We'd all love to see you again. The Renaissance Festival Podcast is brought to you by the fans and performers and the podcast minions. If you enjoy the music you heard, visit renaissancefestivalmusic.com and find out more about the artists who make the music happen. Share your support, buy their music, and tell your friends about the great music you found here. We will see you at the fair. Slancha. The fair is over. The sun begins to set. The cast gathers to feast among the clovers. Friends hug. Enemies hug too. Another year for us to take animosity and shrug. The drums still linger. The story is set. Music overwhelms a sad ballad singer. It passed too quick. What happened to time when musicians would gather to play a few licks? Hold me a moment. Don't say a word. Let me inhale so I can smell the magic that's floating. Another year passes. I think I must have blinked. There's too much I missed and not enough lasses. <laughs> 